also the most loving thing. It's also the most difficult thing that you can do. This message today on forget it is the idea of being able to forgive. If you listen today, you will see that uh, this message actually uh, can change your life. It can lengthen your life. It can keep you from mental illness. It can lower your stress. Because more and more they discover as uh, they do more and more psychological and physical studies that unforgiveness is huge. But it doesn't mean that it's easy. Now last week we talked about the idea of owning it when we started this series, Better Choice Next Time. And we talked about the idea of owning up to your part. So if you missed last week's message, each of these messages is going to build on each other. But it's the idea of owning your part, of admitting that without God you, you can't do it. And, and without Him intervening and, and yet admitting where you fail and when you mess up. Today is kind of the next part of that. It's the idea of understanding that if you get around people, you will have to forgive them. Now, if you don't want to ever have to forgive or deal with the pain of forgiveness, it's very easy. All you need to do is isolate yourself for the rest of your life. The problem with that is your life won't be very long because we need other people. This week, we're going to look at one disciple guy named Peter, honestly, probably my favorite disciple. I haven't met the others, so I can't really say that for sure. Uh, Peter, to me, is the patriarch of ADD people. He was the one who did impulsive things, jumped out of the boat. Not only did he jump out of the boat, he said to Jesus, hey, you're walking on water. Can I try that? He really did. I mean, read it. Read it in context. The other disciples are like, what? <laughs> it's a ghost. No, it's Jesus. It's me, Jesus. Oh, good. I want to try that. <laughs> Another disciple, there he goes. He's the one that brought a sword to the garden. When they came to arrest Jesus, the other disciples kind of backed off, and he went and caught the guy's ear off. I think he, I think he actually probably did this, and the guy went like this, and the ear came off, and Jesus picked it up out of the grass. It's not what we're doing here, Peter, right? <laughs> Peter's the one that at the table the night before Jesus was taken to the cross, he said this. He said this. You read it. He looked at Jesus in front of these guys he had been trapped. These are like his buddies. These are, these are like the people he works with. They are all together. They're all the disciples. And Jesus, Jesus is there. Jesus says, everybody's going to deny me. And Peter looks at his friends and goes, these losers might, <laughs> but not me. He did. He did. That's exactly what he said. And then, of course, you know the story. Um, uh, he went, and uh, uh, he, he was actually closer than any of the other ones. You can give him credit. He's by the fire, and he's asked three times. And by the way, one of the people that recognized him was related to the ear cut off person. Did you know that? It's in, it's in the Bible. And he, said, and, and he basically calls down curses, and then it's rooster time. It's similar to hammer time, but much more convicting. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, he realized I did exactly what Jesus, I'm a failure. I'm a failure. I, I have no right to even say. And he had to remember, listen, he had to remember that Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. And then, of course, there's the cross. And then Jesus' resurrection. Peter's one of the first ones down there. He runs. Shocker. <laughs> And yet, he's the first one to preach. And thousands come to Christ. Because he was able to not only forgive himself, but he was able to be forgiven. And we're going to look at that today. Because some of you that are here today are struggling with forgiving somebody. Maybe somebody who's been dead for a long time. And some of you here today are struggling with forgiving the person in the mirror who did something dumb. And today I'm going to talk about some practical ways you can do it because people ask me all the time, well, how do we do this? And I'll be honest with you. Let me, let me just throw this out there. They're doing research now on forgiveness and the new books that are coming out that are doing research on forgiveness and shame and all this stuff is suddenly in psychology today. That's becoming the big thing. You know who they're learning from? Christians. 
Because Christians honestly know more about forgiveness than any other group because you hang around each other, I think. But anyway, that's another. If you hang around anybody, listen, if you hang around me, let me just throw this at you. If you hang around me, you're going to have to forgive me. And if I hang around you, you're going to have to forgive me. And if you drive near me, by, by the way, I was driving through Titusville the other day. i got to say this. I don't think they're in this service. I was driving through Titusville the other day, and no lie, I saw somebody flying. And I'm in the left lane. I'm behind somebody. I can't go anywhere. And this person flew up and got really close to me, and I did one of those thoughts. Just a tap on the brakes, right? And I looked over, and I am not positive, but I'm about 90% sure as they passed me, it was somebody from our church heading to work, because I know they work up in the county or the city. And they passed me, and I thought, they go to our church. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, it was funny, though, because all of a sudden my attitude changed towards them. Like, uh, doofus. I thought my driving was bad. Good to know somebody in our church is worse. I thought of getting stickers made that said, I don't drive as bad as my pastor. <laughs> Surfside. Yeah. All right, so why we get stuck in unforgiveness and can't move forward? Here it is. Number one, we desire to get even when we have pain. So when you're on Grissom and somebody tailgates you, or even worse, somebody pulls out in front of you, they run that stop sign and they're in a hurry until they get in front of you. That's not even real pain. And yet we decide to get even. But when real pain comes, when somebody hurts us, there's something inside of us that likes vengeance. Number two, we want others to suffer because they hurt us. We want to see them. You know, people talk about karma. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about karma. The, the Bible does talk about you reap what you sow. But can I tell you something else? The Bible also talks a lot about grace. And it's the idea of when somebody hurts you, you bless them. That's what makes Christianity different than everything else. It's the idea that you can forgive an enemy. Number three, we don't believe we deserve forgiveness. Now, this is a deep, dark secret in Christians. The truth is, the reason many people as Christians are stuck is because if they're honest about it, they feel like, I'm not really forgiven. You know, I gave my life to Christ, and now I have to earn it. Now I have to work for it. Now I've got to do a bunch of good things. Oh, I didn't have a quiet time today. God doesn't love me quite as much as he loved me yesterday. Oh, I had a quiet time today. God loves me a little more. I miss church today. God doesn't love me quite as much. I'm not encouraging you to skip. And so we have something in us that says, I don't know that I deserve for I'm messed up. Okay, let me tell you something. God knows you're messed up. So do your friends. <laughs> they might pretend you're not, but they're sitting there going, yeah. <laughs> number four, we like to focus on the mistakes of others. And I think four happens because of number three. We love gossip. We love to get people to gather around us so that we can tell our story the way we see it. And then I was the hero. And that person was an idiot. Right? And everybody goes, oh, yes, yes. Right? They don't actually clap. But what do they do? Oh, yeah, no, I know. No, I know. They've done that to me, too. Yeah, oh, I know. And everybody starts doing that. Knock, blah, 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 blah. By the way, when you're a pastor, you can watch people. If they're gossiping, you can see them in the back because they come in and you see them talking and they all sit and <laughs> Or this. <laughs> but that's usually when they're looking at me. It's like a coach on the sidelines. But we like to focus on the mistakes of others. Why? Because so often we feel like we're in competition. That's the reason sincerity and taking off the mask is so important. Because when you can get to the point that you admit, I am messed up, it makes it a lot easier to love other people. So here's the deal. Today we're going to talk about a very simple subject. We're going to talk about let's make a deal. And Wayne Brady. I have to go into the darkness over here to get my boxes. Please don't just read this little bit. By the way, for those ADD people, I'm going to help you out. It's just paper in the box, so don't think about the box. Oh, no, it's in the box. Is something going to jump out of the box? I can just see a jack in the box. Don't we? Okay, all you ADD people, same thing here. Just piece of paper in here. All right, feel better now? All right. So, do you remember, Let's Make, how many of you have ever seen Let's Make a Deal? Some of you? Okay, if not, I'm going to give you basically the premise, okay? So here's what happens. You come on the show dressed like an idiot. The bigger idiot you are, the more likely you're going to get chosen. Raggedy Ann and Andy's there every week. Every week. Every week. Raggedy Ann and Andy. It's not funny anymore. Anyway, so 
Wayne Brady stands you up, right? And he's got an envelope. And he says, you can have the envelope or you can have what's in box number three or behind curtain number two, or whatever, right? Or you can have the box here or you can have what's behind curtain number five. Remember that? And then, okay, so they, they go, oh, no, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to take curtain number three. And then they open it. And if they lose, what happens? Zonk. You won MC Hammer's parachute pants. Or something. That was actually, I showed Kyle the show the other day, and that literally was on there. It was hilarious. Parachute pants. I was like, that's awesome. And, uh, but it was a zonk. You know, you, you lose. And here's the deal in life. You get two options. One is, you can choose the big box of unforgiveness. By the way, we like this box. This box feels right. When somebody hurts you, all the resentment that you put in here, all the anger, the things you want to say to them, you put in this box, you, you carry it around. And we've all met people that, that you can meet them for five minutes and they're already pulling out the list of what, did you know what happened to me? They got videos in here. They bring them out all the time, replay them. The same videos every time. We'll get to that. But that box of unforgiveness or... You can choose the box of forgiveness. And if we're really honest, you ready? One of the hardest verses in Scripture is this. You cannot carry this box and receive this box from God. It's one of the hardest verses in Scripture. And we're going to get there. We're going to look at Peter. And we're going to look at results of unforgiveness. But we're going to talk about this idea. Listen. If you want to receive forgiveness, you have to forgive. And if you want the rest of your moments, like I talked about last week, to be able to be filled with joy and peace instead of anger and frustration and bitterness, and you want to walk in peace and you want to have grace for people, you've got to forgive. Because when you carry around the unforgiveness box, there are consequences that you don't get to choose. Your attitude, your actions, your heart, your stomach... All kind of things that happen because you walk around with unforgiveness. So let's talk about Peter first. How could Peter forget it and move forward? I've already given you kind of the story of Peter. So we're going to look at just a few things. Number one, Peter recognized his failure and his lack of ability. Peter was there when Matthew 16, verse 18 was spoken. Jesus looked at him and said, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Which, by the way, which, by the way, at that time, Peter probably said, what's a church? I mean, we, we look at it as a normal word. He's like, is that like temple? What does that mean? On this, I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not overcome it. So Jesus looks at Peter and says, you're going to be the head of the church. You're going to be the first part. And he was. He was the one who preached the gospel. It didn't mean that he was going to be the eternal uh, head of the church. It just meant that he was going to be the starting point. And if you look in the book of Acts, Peter gave the first sermon. And you ready for this? Thousands came to Christ. Because of the guy who failed but received forgiveness. And he had to know. You know, Jesus, I thought I was that. When we sat at the table and you said, everybody will deny you, I said, no, I won't. So what happens? Number two. He received God's forgiveness and and. Discovered continual usefulness. I don't know if you've ever failed. <coughs> if you've ever failed at something, one of the first feelings that you will have is, I'm useless. The enemy wants to come to you when you fail and you mess up. When you're the one who blows it, he wants to come to you and says, you're no good, give up. And he wants you to quit. Some of you today need to forgive you so that you can forgive others. Some of you today need to ask forgiveness but you don't need to give up. So when they had finished breakfast, which I love that Jesus comes back from the dead, and one of the first things he does is cook for the disciples, which tells me what heaven's going to be like. Do you ever pay attention to what Jesus did on earth? That's what heaven's going to be like. You know, people imagine angels and harps and all kind of weird stuff that's not in Scripture. And, you know, oh, you know. You know what Jesus did on earth? Went to parties and ate with people and walked. Pay attention. Pay attention. So let me look at it. Tell me I'm wrong. But, you know, kingdom on earth isn't in heaven. Anyway, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus cooks fish. I think in heaven, if you don't like fish, you'll like fish. I'm guessing. I don't know how it works. Maybe it tastes like bacon. 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now listen to all he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Basically, he's reminding him of what he said on the night, remember? I won't deny you, I love you more than these guys. So Jesus starts with that. Let's start there, Peter. Do you love me like you said the other day, more than everybody else? And by the way, when he says love, he does big love, agape. We'll just call it big love for now. Do you big love me? I love it. Peter looks at him and says, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Jesus says to him the second time, then feed my lambs, excuse me. Then he says... A second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Big love. Notice he didn't compare him to anybody else this time. Do you, do you love me, big love? Even, I'm not saying more than these. Do you just love me, big love? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I'm your friend. Jesus said to him, shepherd my sheep. So he said, feed them, now shepherd them. Then he said to him the third time, Simon. <laughs> He keeps renaming them. It's like a parent when you get in trouble. <laughs> Son of John, do you love me? This time he went with, do you friend me? Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time. Two reasons he was grieved. Number one, because he lowered the bar. Number two is because three times. The last times three times happened, he was denying Jesus. Here's what he says. And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. I mean, you knew I was going to deny you. You knew what was going to happen. And then he says, you know that I in friendship love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus was basically telling him, I'm not giving up on you. Don't give, on your, give up on yourself. Continue to do what I've called you to do. They call this the reconciliation of Peter all through Scripture. This is the idea where Peter realized, you know what? I didn't get it all right. I blow it. I can't do it without God. And yet he restores me. Today, some of you need to know that. Number three, he knew he had to forgive as he was forgiven. He was there during Matthew chapter 6. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. By the way, this is right after the Lord's Prayer. But if you do not forgive, if you carry around the unforgiveness box, your Father will not forgive you. I would love to sugarcoat this passage and tell you that doesn't not true. I can't get around this one. This is how serious forgiveness is. Now realize that forgiveness is not saying what somebody did is okay. And it's not allowing somebody to hurt you or abuse you. Forgiveness is saying, I'm going to release you. By the way, it doesn't mean that the person doesn't get punished. If somebody steals your car, forgiving them doesn't mean that you don't say, I don't want them to hurt anybody else. Put them in jail for a few days so they can remember. But forgiveness means... That you let them go. So how can I forget it and move forward? What we're going to do is look at First and Second Peter. He wrote those words. And as we look at First and Second Peter, we're going to look at what does this guy Peter know about forgiveness? Do you think he knows a little bit? You think we could probably learn a couple things from him? How many think we could learn a couple things from him? How many are ready to go home now and forget it? Okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> the way you were looking at me, I'm like, some of you are like. Really? Is he serious about? Because I'm hungry. <laughs> Number one. Receive his mercy for you by asking forgiveness. Now, there's a lot in this passage, so I'm going to try to just pull it apart just a little for you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Peter's saying. Hey, he's awesome. Peter knew he was awesome. Do you realize how loving it had to feel when Peter was in the presence of Jesus? Knowing that he blew it the worst way you could blow it. I mean, Judas, Judas is the only one who did anything worse. By the way, I still, well, that's another, I'm not going into theology. All right. In his great mercy, listen to this, in his great mercy, he knew God's mercy. You know what God's mercy is? It's you don't deserve forgiveness, but he gives it to you anyway. His great mercy says you blow it, you mess up, and I still absolutely love you. 
If you did something dumb this morning, God loves you just as much as he loved you yesterday when you did everything right. And by the way, if you did everything right yesterday, would you come see me later because I need a lesson? You must have not talked to anybody. Did you stay in bed all day, maybe? I don't know. I, even then, I'm like, man. Probably texted somebody or something wrong. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth. You know what that means? A whole new life, a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of seeing life. Through hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He was there. He saw it. He knew about it. And into an inheritance. Hang on to that word inheritance. I'm getting there. That's going to be the important part. We're going to pull that out. That can never perish, spoil, or fade. Listen, listen. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. All right, so I want you to imagine something today that's a little weird, which is nothing new when you hear me speak. All right, so imagine today I come by your house. Hello. It's Pastor Eric. Put all the alcohol away. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I thought it was too far, too far, too far. I'm trying to look to see who would understand what I was talking about. Bob, Bob, you would. All right, so. Bob's like, I'm with you. You were saying the bomb, weren't you? Yeah, I was thinking bomb. All right. Put it away. Pastor's here, right? So I knock on the door. You open the front door. Some of you are like, what is that? Thankfully. All right. So you open the front door, right? And you've got your counter sitting there. And, and you've got a dollar on the counter. And I go, hey, good to see you. I grab the dollar and I run out the door. You're probably not angry. You're confused. You're worried about my mental health. You are perplexed. As I jump in my car and drive away, you're thinking, you know, if he needed a dollar. Right? Why would it not matter that much to you? Because it's a dollar. And compared to the tens of dollars that you have, I know where we go to church. Somebody said, do you have a lot of millionaires in your church? I said, I have a hundred heirs. Many hundred heirs. They've got hundreds of dollars in debt. <laughs> so if I took a dollar from you, why? It wouldn't matter that much. Why? Because you have tens of dollars. Maybe hundreds of dollars. Maybe thousands of dollars. Let's just give you a lot of grace, okay? You're like, I do. When you count my visa, I've got... I mean, I'm not even close to my limit. They just keep raising it, and I'm good. I'm good. Dave Ramsey class just ended. We'll do it again next year if you think that's appropriate. All right. So if I took a dollar, you wouldn't care why, because it's not much compared to what you have. But if you open the door and there you had a priceless heirloom sitting there from your family that you knew was worth a lot of money, and I said, oh, good to see you, and I grabbed it, and I ran off with it, you'd track me down. Some of you would tackle me and punch me in the face. <laughs> Rightly so, right? I stole something valuable from you. It mattered to you why, because all of a sudden the value was increased versus what you had. Would you appreciate it if somebody gave you a million dollars? How many in here, let's just find out, how many of you would appreciate it if I gave you a million dollars? I want to look around. Is anybody not raising their hand because I want to borrow money from you? I'll be over later, Matt. All right. I know where you live. All right, so, um, it'd be hilarious if I go by a <laughs> he lived it out. Pastor's weird. All right, so believe it or not, there's a guy who is mad at a million dollar inheritance. Andrew Carnegie left one of his relatives, I'm pretty sure it was a nephew, left him a million dollars. He was furious. He wrote an article in the paper at how mad he was that his uncle would leave him a measly million dollars out of his 630 something million dollars. How dare my uncle only leave me a million. Isn't life so much about perspective? And by the way, a million dollars at that time was like a billion now. So let me ask you this. Do you need to forgive somebody for money or finances they stole from you? When you get to heaven, the streets are made of gold. 
If you took a backpack of gold to heaven, the angels would thank you for bringing pavement. Thanks, more pavement. Good stuff. Did somebody steal your joy? You went through a time in life that was tough and you blamed that person. They ruined that part of my life. I've never been the same since then. I want you to know in heaven, the Bible says there's no more sorrow. They stole your health. Or maybe one of your friends' health. 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 Maybe one of your friends' health. I don't know how you say that. You figure it out. They stole health from one of your friends. How do I do, Mike? Is that good? My English major back there. All right. <coughs> maybe they did. And maybe you're in pain because of it. I know people who've had a doctor accidentally sever a nerve. Or other people who've been in car accidents, somebody else's fault, a drunk driver. And you're in pain all the time. The Bible says in heaven there's no more pain, which those of you who have back trouble are like, hallelujah. Maybe for some of you, I've heard this over and over as people sit in my office and cry. They say they stole the best years of my life. Or in other cases, they stole my childhood. They stole my innocence. I want you to know in heaven, here's what's awesome. Eternal life. You will get all those years back. When you compare what's been taken from you compared to what God has given you, it makes it a little harder to hang on to this box. Now, I'm not saying that what was stolen from you is not important. It is. And I'm not saying you shouldn't grieve over that. You should. It is painful. It is hurtful. Forgiveness. You have to feel the pain before you can forgive someone. You can't just say, oh, it's no big deal. A lot of you lie about that. It is a big deal. If you're still remembering it, it's a big deal. Even if you're trying to tell yourself it's not a big deal. If you're remembering it, it's a big deal. Hey, but realize how much God has given you. This box might be smaller, but it's so much better. Number two, learn to love deeply and sincerely. Wouldn't you rather have love than anger? Wouldn't you rather have peace than irritation? By the way, did you know an angry person doesn't even know they're angry most of the time? How many of you know an angry person? You know an angry person? If you didn't raise your hand, it's you. <laughs> Now that you have purified yourselves, Peter said, by obeying the truth so you have sincere love for each other. Listen, love one another deeply from the heart. The only way you can be sincere is to be honest about your own failures. The only way you can be sincere is to realize I do not have it together. When Jesus kept asking Peter those questions, you know what Peter finally said? Okay, you know. Why? Because he knew. Number three. Practice the keys to forgiveness and blessing. If you're going to give forgiveness, if you're going to receive forgiveness, if you're going to forgive yourselves, you probably ought to take this verse if you're struggling with forgiving somebody. Because I know some of you have had horrible things happen to you. You may have to take this verse and just say it over and over. All of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, we pay evil with blessing because to this you were called that you may inherit a blessing. Christians tend to struggle with one way or the other. They either justify what somebody does or they forgive them or they think if I forgive them, I have to justify what they've done or they hate them and they won't forgive them. You can say what you did was wrong. I forgive you. That's what Joseph did in the Old Testament. He said to his brothers, you meant that for evil. When his brothers came to him, he didn't say to his brothers, listen, he could have looked at his brothers and said, no big deal. All these years of being in jail and being beaten. But he didn't. He said, what you meant for evil, God worked out for good. By the way, the Bible says if you follow God's will, he works all things for the good. It doesn't say everything's good. There's a lot of bad things in life. If you want to be able to forgive people, you cannot keep... Is somebody like banging on the door? Are we okay? <laughs> Everybody look over. If you want to forgive people, you can't keep pulling out the VCR tape. We used to have VCR tapes. You had to rewind them. You could watch them backwards. We had film reels in class that we would put on. Remember, 
No? Okay. Some of you, you keep reaching in and re-watching what somebody did for you. That person hasn't thought of you in years, and you continue to replay the tape. Can I tell you a secret about replays? They never change. You watched a movie last week, and even though you've seen Indiana Jones 500 times, you keep telling the lady, let go of the jewel and hang on to Indy. And she keeps letting go, and you're like, oh, you're dumb again. <laughs> every time. You tell her. Every Anybody else do that? I try to tell her. At least in my head, I think, she's done it again. But Indy's going to do what's right. And you know the end of the story. But when you watch it, you still, and here's the deal. We think that when we replay that tape, it's going to change. It's not going to change. All it's going to do, and they've actually done studies. Did you know when you replay the tape, it actually hurts you again? Why do you want to keep allowing somebody who's no longer in your life to hurt you? And by the way, if they're abusive and they're still in your life, the Bible does not say you have to hang around an abusive person. Somebody can hurt you and you don't have to hang around them. Forgiveness is not forgetting. And forgiveness is not saying, oh, I don't remember any of that. Forgiveness can make you wise, though. Quit rehearsing what they did. Quit having conversations about what you'll say to them the next time you'll see them. Every time you find yourself doing that, ask God to help you to forgive. And here, I'm going to give you, this may be all you need to hear from the message, and I know we're going over time, but, but this is really important, okay? This may be the only thing you need to hear today, so I'm going to give it to you, okay? I've had a lot of people to forgive in my life, and so have you. And sometimes it's very hard because people do things that are beyond forgivable, right? They hurt you on purpose. Not on accident, not by slight. They went after you and hurt you or lied about you or did something to you. Those are big things. And here's what I imagine when that happens. I imagine myself taking that person or this box before Jesus on the cross. And I put the box or I even take the person to the cross. And I say, Lord, I don't want to forgive this person. But you forgave me. Can you help me to forgive them? And I just imagine myself coming before Jesus and knowing that he would say, I forgive you to me. And Lord, I need your help forgiving. Now, forgiving, once again, is not forgetting. Forgiveness doesn't mean that I have to hang around that person. Forgiveness doesn't mean to allow that person to hit me, hurt me again or hit me again. It means to say, I release you. I'm not coming after you. You don't owe me anything anymore. I release it. Now, it doesn't mean if somebody doesn't steal your car, you don't send them to jail. You, you do that to protect other people. But it means that you take the person before Christ and you let it go. Number four, continue doing good knowing pain has a season. So then those who suffer according to God's will, listen, should commit themselves to the faithful creator and continue to do good. Here's what they've discovered. People who rise up again, people who go through adversity and hurt and pain and unforgiveness, one of the best things they can do is when they're flat on their face, when they're struggling with unforgiveness, when they begin to learn how to forgive and they look over and they see other people dealing with the same thing, helping them helps them. Joseph, when he was in jail, he looked over, the Bible says, and he saw two other inmates who were sad. Can I tell you that that had to be tough to see while in jail? Like, I can't imagine walking into the jail in Sharps and going, are you sad? <laughs> but the Bible says even in his victimization, even though he was hurt his whole life, he looked over and noticed they were sad. And what did he do? He helped them, even in his struggle. Some of you are struggling today, you're hurting today, you're in pain today. I encourage you, don't quit doing what's good. Why? Because God's good. And what will happen? The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while. What? I thought the Bible said you become a Christian, you don't suffer. Not my Bible. After that, he'll restore you. Hang on to that. And make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. He will restore you. He will restore me. Would you do your best to not say that cult-like, but we're going to say that together, okay? We're going to say, He will restore me. You ready? One, two, three. He will restore me. That was a little too cult-like. Let's try it one more time. Okay, ready? One. The people in my video, I promise they're not sitting out there like this. He will restore me. Okay? Ready? One, two, three. 
For some of you struggling with unforgiveness, you should take a white marker and write that on the mirror in your bathroom. He will restore me. Streets of gold, no more sorrow, no more pain. You will have pain for a little while. Listen, if you love anybody, you're going to have pain. Hey, if you love a dog, you're going to have pain. You got the cutest little dog. <laughs> My dog's so cute that somebody this week met him and bought a, his brother. That's how cute my dog is. <laughs> Number five. Guard yourself against evil people. This seems to be the opposite of the sermon, but it's not. Peter teaches all in 1 Peter about grace and love and loving people. And in 2 Peter, he starts to say, but there's some bad people. And you need to realize there's some bad people. And like Hill Street Blues said, be careful out there. Too many Christians think that loving means being dumb. It doesn't mean being dumb. Loving means we have real good boundaries. We'll be talking about boundaries later this year. Guard yourself against evil. Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so you may not be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure position, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to Him. Be the glory now and forever. Listen, you don't have to take abuse from people. You don't have to let people abuse you. But you can have good boundaries and yet forgive. You don't have to let somebody take advantage of you and yet you can forgive. You can be a good boss and even fire people sometimes and yet forgive. You can be a parent who has discipline and yet forgive. You can be somebody who doesn't let somebody steal from you and yet forgive. And here's the deal. If you had somebody hurt you on purpose in the past, they have characteristics that if you pay attention to, you will meet others with those same characteristics. If you get around people who never apologize, who always think they're right, who never admit a fault, be very careful of those people. Because I can tell you right now, those people that hurt you in the past had those characteristics. Pay attention. Be careful out there. If you want to be all God has for you, you can't pick up this box anymore. You can't take it to the cross and go, God, I choose to forgive them. And then take it home. And when you find yourself picking this box up again, guess what? Forgiveness is not a one-time thing. Do it again. If you love people, you're going to have to forgive. And here's the awesome part. When you do that, even though this box is smaller, you find love, real love, and joy. And peace. Your stress goes away. You're more loving with people. You ready for this? You drive better. <laughs> because as you learn to forgive, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, you learn, you know what? They're just as messed up as I am. You should see me drive. And then you receive God's forgiveness. The Bible says, you know how the Bible says other people will know about Jesus? By your love. When you receive his forgiveness, when you give forgiveness, me, when you give forgiveness to people who don't reserve, re deserve it, when you give forgiveness, you get filled with his love. You'll lengthen your life. You'll bless the people around you. You'll leave a heritage of blessing generation after generation when you learn the hardest thing in life, the most loving thing you can do to forgive. If you're here today and you've never received that gift of forgiveness from God. Today you can say, Jesus, I'm messed up. I'm broken. I know I've sinned. I surrender to you. I know you died on the cross to take my sins. Forgive me. Come into my life. I want to make you first. You can do that today. I'd be glad to talk to you after the service. We have our offering in a minute. and You can come right after that. You might be here today and you're a Christian. The truth is you're hanging on to something. I encourage you, start the journey. I know you can't do it on your own. That's why you need his help. He knows all things. You take it to him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for the gift of forgiveness. Lord, I hate that I have to forgive people. And I hate that I have to be forgiven sometimes. And yet, Lord, you're so good. You've given us your grace and your mercy beyond anything we deserve. Father, I pray if anybody's watching online struggling with unforgiveness, that even right now they could put all of that at your feet. And trust you for forgiveness. 
Father, I pray also for anyone here who's struggling with forgiving themselves or forgiving someone else, that today would be the day that you break that bondage, and Father, that you give them forgiveness and the ability to forgive others. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of giving now. If you're giving online, you can give online, but if you're giving today, you just give what God's put on your heart today. Thanks for being here this morning.